Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three supplements for Beyond the Wall and other adventures. This one is Further Afield, then I'm going to be going through Dangers Near and Far, and the third one is A Kingless Realm. So these are all three supplemental in that they prov they uh, talk about you know additional rules and features, lots of uh, extra spells and monsters. Um, really, really cool supplemental books. And these are all pretty long. This one, which is further afield, is the shortest. It's 109 pages. Uh, Dangers Near and Far is 171. And A Kingless Realm is 187. So there's quite a lot of material in these three books. Uh, I'm going to go through them you know, relatively quickly because they're all so long. But just give you guys a sense of what they are. I think these are all really cool. And if you're planning on running Beyond the Wall and other adventures, I'd highly recommend all three of these books. I think, in fact, they're... I wouldn't say they're required or essential, but they are really, really useful in expanding to the point where I would find... Uh, expanding the material that you have available to you as a, as a game master to the point of um, almost being necessary. Because there's so many additional rules in here, so much good advice in here, and lots of extra cool stuff in each of these books that I think is just really good if you're going to run this game. And even if you're not going to run this game, there's still a lot of good advice and a lot of good material here that you could steal for other games. Um, but it's mostly for this system. All right, so first off, uh, this is, again, uh, Further Afield, a breakdown of what's in this book. And here is the introduction to this book. You get uh, this idea of the shared sandbox, which is one of the this book's kind of primary contributions. Now, the shared sandbox is essentially a way of generating a campaign um, collaboratively at the whole table with all of your players. Collaborative world building is something that's, you know, obviously a part of the hobby. Some people really love it. Other people really don't, right? Both players and GMs. I think collaborative world building is one of those things that's pretty divisive. Some people just say, oh yeah, it's every time we do it. And I think all of us to some degree allow a little bit of this, right? A character, a player when they're making a character will say, hey, can I have, can I come from here? Or can I have done this? Or I, my, you know, I'm from this old lost order. And then you're like, okay. And you kind of work with them to make it a real thing in your world. So collaborative world building is something we all do. But to explicitly sit down and say, okay, guys, we're going to make a, a sandbox together. We're going to make a region together. That's not something that everybody does. But I think everybody should try it. Every GM should try it at least once and see how, they, how, how it feels. Because I found it to be actually a lot of fun. You don't have complete control. That's true. You have to give that away. And some players like to be surprised by the world. But it does give everybody a sense of ownership. And very often, some of the most creative worlds that I've developed have been collaborative. Because, you know, I'll have an idea, and then my player will, will, will riff on that, and then I will riff on that. And it becomes this sort of new thing that neither of us would have come up with on our own. And it's really creative for that. So, you know, this gives you rules for how to do it, steps to take. Um, and, uh, you know, first you do this, and then you do that. And it's, it's good advice for how to go through this process of making, making a, a shared sandbox together, a region and what you should add, and who gets to choose what, and all of that stuff. Uh, and then this book also has really great little sidebars uh, for just little bits of advice, like <laughs> how to deal with reluctant players in this case. I think that's cool. Um, just some good uh, advice for this process, which again is not something that everybody is going to be interested in, but I think everybody should try it if you've never done it. Uh, how to fill the map on your own. Uh, and just advice about how to do that. I think this is all really good advice as well with you know, the difference between regions and major locations using threats. And then there's this idea of threat packs. So threat packs are something that this book introduces. Um, and essentially it's like putting, well, threat packs. It's putting threats into the world that are active in a way that are going to draw your player's attention. Now, this paragraph here says that you don't have to use threat packs if you want a classic sandbox experience, right? If you just want the players to go around and go from place to place, then don't use threat packs because threat packs are going to draw your attention. They're going to be something in the region that needs to be dealt with. And there's really good advice, though, for how to use them uh, and how to, how to make them later. So I think threat packs are a really good idea because it, prov it provides sort of a loose story, not something that's like, okay, you're going to begin with this story, but it ties, as, as you'll see when we get to some of the threat packs, when you're creating your characters, when you're starting the campaign, you're supposed to be seeding these into the very creation process and using the characters into the threat pack, uh, sort of back and forth. Now, again, we'll show you what you mean exactly, but there are rules for how the threats pr proceed and and uh, things like that. So it's a little bit like, you know, other games have this system, like Fronts, for example, or Mouse Ritter has um, that system of faction play and what's going on in the background. Threat packs are a little bit like that where there are 
things that they're, you know, a, a progress that will happen to the threat, locations that are important to that, and uh, and the players don't necessarily have to engage with it, but if they don't, then things will proceed. Advice for running the campaign: timekeeping, dynamic locations so that places are you know not static. That when you come back to a village or when you come back to a place, it's different there. That's really good, and and so I think this is much more. This book is much more advice heavy, which again, it, in a standard RPG book, is not really what I'm looking for. But in a supplemental book, I could see it being useful because you know that's why you might be getting a supplemental book is because you want additional help in running this particular kind of game or running that particular kind of game or something like that. Rules for travel and exploration, advice for those things. Travel times at a glance, I really like that too. Little little bits of information like that are, are very very helpful to me. Camping and how to make camping relevant and easy sustenance and how to make that a part of the game. Equipment packs and armor, bows and arrows, treasure, right? All of those basic things that uh, advice for how to run those things if you want to make your game you know, a bit more equipment focused or something like that. How to deal with death and making new characters um, and how to uh, you know, just bring them right into the, the game right away. Character traits, a whole bunch of new character traits. Uh, th this is um, basically a new way of individual uh, making your characters more individual and making them more interesting, right? So you have alignment traits. This is something from, uh, we saw this in uh, Through Sunken Lands, right? In the base book of that, there were this idea of character traits. Well, here they're bringing it back into the Beyond the Wall. So alignment traits, basic traits, combat traits. You can think of them as ways of making your characters slightly different, slightly more interesting, slightly unique. You get them at certain times as you level up. And then based on certain playbooks, you can have set traits, right? If so, if you're if you're the uh, the devout acolyte, then you can get the oathkeeper or tenacity. If you're the young woodsman, you get mighty shot or unassuming. These certain traits that you can start with. Now you'll notice here that there's a whole bunch of playbooks that aren't in the base game. That's because there are a lot of supplemental books that you can get. I think for free for the most part, or at least for very cheap. I think they're free though. That have a whole bunch of extra playbooks that you can get. The nobility, elves, dwarves, and halflings, elders, uh, extra villagers. Uh, just a whole bunch of extra playbooks that are out there. It's not that hard to make your own playbooks, but it's nice to have a whole bunch more that come in. Experience revisited. So how to do different experience? How to gain experience differently? Um, and I think there's rules in here for mo yeah monster experience because that's not really in the base game. You don't get experience for killing monsters, but there's a, a, a rule here for how to give experience based on hit dice or hit points. Um, and I think that's that's cool. More uses for coin. This is really good. Money is always one of those things that I think players find a hard... After a certain point, players have a hard time spending. <laughs> and so the base game doesn't have a whole lot of things to spend money on. Uh, this book does. Food and drink, lodging, light sources, livestock and transport, watercraft, clothing, homes and architecture, fortification, odds and ends. That's great. Treasures and particular kinds of treasures. So civilization treasure, barbarian treasure, monster hordes, grave goods, magical caches, fairy treasures. This is what I meant too by this book having some tables that'll be useful in any game, not just uh, beyond the wall, but but tables that are useful in any game. Traders' goods, otherworldly artifacts, a uh, sidebar about how to choose your treasure type. Treasure type. Rules for creating magical items, really, really cool here. And then some examples of uh, magic items, the single-handed sailor, the war crown, healing potions. Uh, items of deed, which is really cool too. So they're the really powerful items with personalities and things like that. The first king's sword, the lover's loom, and then enchanted items, along with rules for rituals to chant your own items. That's really cool too. There's different levels of them. So first level, second level, or sorry, first level ritual, a level four level ritual for the second enchantment, level seven ritual for the third enchantment, level 10 ritual for the final enchantment. So very powerful. And the final enchantment, I think these are really cool. I'll read through it. Level 10 ritual, the final en en enchantment, which is intelligence. Range, touch, duration, instant, save, no. Very rarely do mages attain enough power to cast the final enchantment, and rarer still are those who have the opportunity to work such a great magic. Items holding this enchantment are among the greatest wonders of the world and gain a greater power in addition to their others. Examples of greater powers are plus five bonus to hit and damage on a weapon, or the power to banish any spirit of a particular type for a century from the realms of men once per day, a plus, a plus five bonus to all saving throws, or an extraordinary and unique ability, such as a huge anvil which may summon an apocalyptic storm or cause an eclipse when struck. Bonuses to hit, damage, and or other rules are not cumulative with those granted gained from previous enchantments. Greater powers should be game-changing and awe-inspiring. The sky is the limit when creating greater powers. Finally, all magic items bearing the final enchantment count as artifacts. Gaining the material components for this ritual should be the impetus for several sessions worth of play or perhaps an entire short campaign. 
A spear of ensorcelled iron, which is the deadliest weapon in the world, might require the ashes of the seven great emperors of the ancient world. A cauldron, which opens a portal to the lands of the dead, might require the ending of an entire civilization. Really, really cool idea here to build your own magic items using rituals, but the rituals are both mechanical and flavorful. That's why I love the magic in this game so much. I think it's one of the highlights of Beyond the Wall. Magic is so cool. And it's mechanical, but also flexible mechanical, and, and it understands that the mechanics are there to help you tell the story. So really, really fantastic here. And some sample enchanted items. And then Magic Revisited, so how to, how to focus in on components, how to learn new spells, some extra rituals, and things like that. The Patient Word is a really cool one. I love this one. It's basically you cast a ritual, but then you hold the effect until later. But it's dangerous to hold that kind of magic inside you, and it can, it can be let loose if things go wrong. So you're holding back. You've cast a ritual, but you haven't said that last Patient Word. I like that a lot. Really cool. You could have that be a really cool moment in the campaign where someone's sitting there quietly, and you know there's a big negotiation happening, and the enemy, one of his advisors or something, is just not speaking. And then suddenly he says the patient word. He says the last word of the ritual, and boom, something happens. Huge. You know, some big ritual goes off. That'd be really cool. A whole bunch of them throughout this. That's one of the things this book adds in. Just a whole bunch more rituals. And they're all really cool. I like rituals. One of my favorite parts, as I said, of this game. Alternate rules. So there's, you know, in Beyond the Wall, the base rule is to roll under system, but some things are rolling high, and they recognize that that's sometimes frustrating for some people. So here are rules for always rolling high. And what that will do to ability scores, and it will make you know 10 and 12 no different. Which is you know that's how mostly uh, 5e players um, get used to that, right? That there is no difference between an 11 and a 10, or they get that there's no difference between a 15 and a 14 in 5e and in a lot of D&D games. Uh, but Beyond the Wall has that roll under system, and so there are differences between the individual scores. But if you want to do away with that and just have a roll over system, it does it. Some combat options, space in the battlefield, stances. I like stances quite a lot. Um, this is something that I saw in The One Ring, and that's, how, that's kind of how combat happens in The One Ring is through stances. You can add that sort of idea into this game here, fighting with two weapons and ways of using fortune points. And then there are tables for sample regions, deserts, grasslands, mountains, the road, ruined land, seas and oceans, swamp or fen, woodland. Minor locations and some tables to quickly roll them up. What type of location is this? This, who lives at this location? What makes this location interesting? Just quick tables. And it's also helpful to think about things in that way. Now, the rest of this book are basically threat packs and play aids. So extra um, playbooks and things like that and threat packs. Uh, the threat packs, as I talked about, were these you know, sort of regional dangers that are going on. You have the blighted land uh, along with the ritual to bring it about in the first place. I like this one a lot. Perhaps the most insidious thing about the Blighted Land ritual is how easy it is to cast. That's such a cool idea. I had never really thought about that before. Making something really uh, harmful to the world easy to cast, which is why it's kind of maybe spreading out. Maybe there's some secret spell, in this case, the Blighted Land ritual, which is actually very easy to cast. And so it starts to pop up around as people you know, use it for their own purposes. Um, someone has spread the ritual, the knowledge of the ritual around. That would be a problem in and of itself, not only dealing with the blight as it appears in these different places, but who started it? How do we stop it at its source if it's so easy to cast? Um, it's like the genie out of the bottle. Once you've, once you've opened it, how do you get it back in? And then there are, there are locations that are tied to the blight, uh, as well as ways of you know, dealing with the different threats there and encounters that go along with it, how player actions might be able to counter it. Uh, NPCs and monsters that are associated with this particular kind of blight, and then a page for it. So the imminence of the threat, the encounters you might have, the effects of it, spells against it, but work against it. Clues list, right? So where can you find clues that lead to the source of the blight? Uh, and then denizens of the blight. That was the entire thing of that one threat pack. Then you get the Great Prince, which is another threat pack. Really another cool idea. And one of the things that's interesting is that each of these have something during character creation. So for this one it says, the GM should note the first six skills that the player characters learn, including the skills that come from their character packs. Learning these skills will be a big part of their character's childhoods, and so will be important to the Great Prince later. And then it says, the second village map location that the players develop is strongly related to the Great Prince. So that means, you know, as you're doing your collaborative world building, that's assuming what you're doing here. The second place the players develop, you take and you make that related to the Great Prince. That's some, something that they're um, connected to. So this is, you pick these before the first the session zero. When players are doing their character creation, you have your threat packs that you know you're going to deal with. But then you adapt them a bit based on um, 
based on what the players are saying. So, and, and then, for example, when the players roll on the second table for their childhood, the one which asks, how did you distinguish yourself as a child? The Grey Prince gains extra powers. Make a note of each player's results and refer below. So then you see how, how each player relates to the Grey Prince, who is this sort of nightmarish figure that, that challenges people in their dreams. And the way to defeat it is a little bit like... Uh, it that movie with Stephen King, like it's it's this uh, a group of a, a bond that comes together and defeats it with this bond of love rather than powerful magic. It's a cool idea. I like it a lot. The players have to discover it, uh, and that this is this thing has been once defeated before, and they have to try to do it again. Creepy creatures that go along with it too. Uh, gray nightmare princelings, dream dwellers, princelings. It's such a good idea. Such a good word for this thing. Uh, the Imperial City, this is not so much like a threat, but more like a location which is going to... Well, it has threats associated with it, but it's a city, kind of fallen old Imperial City that's nearby, but it's still got, you know, politics and things happening there. It's a good idea. It's not your village, but it's close enough to your village that it's infringing on it and stuff's happening there. Schemes are happening in the village over the course of years, right? And I think that's interesting too. So it says year one threat effects, year two threat effects. And so as the years pass then your, your, the city will start to impin, infringe upon the, the town. And so it's more long-term. Then the Vengeful Worm, you got a dragon, um, and how to deal with that. And there's some uh, extra stuff at the end, blank hex maps and maps there. A lunar convenient year, so <laughs> where the, uh, the moon phases happen at the same day every month. So it's just simple, straightforward. If you want a calendar, uh, you know, a worksheet for you, you can just use this. That way you don't have to come up with a really complicated you know, moons happening at different times of the month thing, which they really do, but it's more convenient to have it be con uh, consistent. There are apps for this too. Uh, there are really good uh, uh, lunar calendar maps and things like, uh, th there's one that I use for my West Marches, which has, you can program, you know, every sort of holiday and festival and different moons and planets and cycles. And it's really cool. It, it's, it's complex. And I just use that. Uh, I refer to it when I, before I play a session to see what the moons are like or the planets are like, but but if you don't have that or you don't want it to go into that depth, you can use something like a simple calendar system. And then another character sheet, and that's it for this one. Beyond the Wall, Further Afield. So a great book, really, really cool tables, and great advice, especially if you're going to be running Beyond the Wall. Useful for other games, but pretty much specifically for this. Now, Dangers Near and Far is another one of these great supplemental materials, and it, this one's a little bit longer, 171 pages. This one has a lot of collected material from a lot of other books. So it's Hearts and Homes, The Wicked Dark, Across the Veil, and From Distant Lands. So it's, it's a compilation of a lot of really small books, but it has some additional stuff too. And I really like this one too, because this one has a lot of extra spells, playbooks, and uh, some like, you know, uh, more, more uh, adventure packs and things like that. Dangers afoot. <laughs> New characters, multi-class characters, uh, new options for that. Expanding the village, because the village is sort of like your home base. You're going to be coming back there over and over. It's, it's sort of the, the, you know, the, the hub of your adventure. So rules for expanding it, making particular kinds of characters. There's the grandmother weaver, the innkeeper, the smith, the watch, the witch, right? Unusual villagers, which is kind of cool. The fey emissary, the guardian, the successful merchant. And then there's really cool uh, advice for village customs, like weddings, funerals, naming ceremonies, the beating of the bounds, militia, superstitions, different festivals you can have there, the equinox festivals. So great little advice for making your village feel like a village, an old you know, medieval or pre-medieval village. Adversaries and extra adversaries and advice for making them interesting. So making your bandits a little more interesting, your barbarians a little more interesting, the dead or the fairy troops or goblins. Really good ideas there. How to use the Troubled Village, which is one of the adventure packs, the scenario packs that this book comes with. It's a little bit, it requires a little bit more work, so it gives you advice on how to run it, which I think is kind of cool. New spells, new creatures, uh, including a lot of barbarian creatures and things like that. Rules for war and battle, so how to do mass combat, which is, I think, really interesting. And not something that you would usually, certainly it happens in the source material that this book draws from, things like, um, you know, Floyd Alexander's um, series. You know, the, the Book of Three series, the uh, Chronicles of Pridain. There are lots of big battles that happen in that book series. Usually it's a little, it's mostly off screen, but not always. So here would be something like that. How to do troops in battle, the battle itself rolling there, how characters and particular NPCs might fare in the battle. That's really cool. And then the aftermath and what you can do. Um, all right, then the underworld and how to get there. Travel in the underworld, the dead, the lay of the land. In underworld encounters the veil which is the separation between this world and the next and where you can find the veil to be weaker and when it can be opened and things like that 
Necromancy, in particular rituals and spells related to necromancy, the dead and their ilk, the foolish mortal, captain of the dead, the revenant, the whispering spirit. Goblin magic, new spells, this is great. The door in the dark, it's a great spell. Ritual, a door in the dark, range, the cosmos, duration, permanent, save, no. This frighteningly easy to cast ritual can open or close one of the portals to Goblin Town found in most goblin holes. The portal must already exist and the caster must be in the presence of such a portal, though it does not matter on what side he casts the ritual. The material component for this ritual are a bed of human blood and a brush of thick and bristling hog hair. Cowardly goblin sorcerers like to drain the blood of sleeping humans and keep it in small black files on their persons at all times. It's a great spell. Uh, making goblins revisited. You have some base stats, goblin champions, lots of rules for making goblins, and then goblin beasts. So you can have cool goblins with particular goblin traits. Right? It's very uh, fairy tale esque. I like this a lot. Goblins are one of those uh, monsters that I love, but I like making goblins interesting. They're not just green-skinned cowards that go and charge you. No, make them fairy tale like and goblins become really, really cool. Um, goblin caves and, and different um, regions within those, neighborhoods within them, rooms and special features, exits, example caves, with a cool little you know, point map of a, of a goblin cave and what might be in each of these different regions of it. How to make scenario packs, basically adventures, but you know, loose adventures that aren't just particularly, um, you know, go here, do this, go there, do that. So scenario packs are a bit more open-ended. More magical items, particular magical items like the Stag's Lament or the Mercy Blade. Great, uh, you know, wonderfully flavorful magical item names. Fool's Coin, the Gem of the Firstborn, the Ring of Ensorcelled Iron. The flavor of Beyond the Wall is just like head and shoulders twice over better than D&D 5e, better than a lot of books. I mean, at least, you know, it appeals to me because I love this particular style of fantasy. Ursula Le Guin, Lloyd Alexander, I love that, you know, um, fairy tale side of fantasy. This is like, in, in a way, it reminds me a little bit of some of the elements of Dolmenwood, although Dolmenwood leads more into Gonzo, more into a little ridiculousness, more into silly. This is, it's, both of them have the same fairy tale wonder and whimsy um, and sort of an epic but also grounded quality which I really love the draconic crown I think actually one of the things I've just been I just realized is that that setting that I did uh, that I reviewed a while back on the uh, the sort of bay where it, that art with the I just I, I went through it I, I really really think it's it's really awesome I think that would fit a lot with beyond the wall now that I think about it, I think the tone of that setting would fit really well with this with this system. Uh, a master index in this book, which is really great, right? Which page all of these different spells are on, the playbooks are on, where you can find them, the scenario packs. So a great little uh, index of all of the different books that you're going to need. Some threat packs, some more threat packs, the Barbarian Invasion, the Goblin Raiders, the Risen Dead, the Wicked Tradesman, and then character playbooks as well. So you have the Adventurous Trader, the Barbarian Namer, the Goblin's Child, the Lord's Secret, the Lost Barbarian, and then the Student of the Dark Arts. And then some scenario packs as well. Uh, the Barbarian Tribe, uh, the Delivery Quest, the Goblin Infestation, the Lordling's Lament, the Open Barrow, the Troubled Village, and the Witch's Mistake. There might be one more. Nope, that's it. All right, so Beyond the Wall, uh, Dangers Near and Far is another fantastic book. This one has just a ton of great stuff in it. I'd recommend it as well, along with the first one. Now, the third of these that I was going through is A Kingless Realm. And I think this is just, I think it's recently released. Um, I got it very recently, just a few days ago, really. Um, this one is similar to the others. It has expanded rules, more character options, more spells, and a full campaign, including a campaign region. So this is oh, this is like a, an actual world um, with maps, history, monsters, and stuff, and so this is a this is a a setting as well. It has a lot of other rules, but it also has settings, uh, a a setting, and I like the setting a lot. I'm not going to go into too much detail in it, but it is really really cool. So no rules again for multiclassing the failed ranger and the horned king's brood. Rules for untried heroes. Now this is something like level zero characters. They're basically pre class pre playbook characters. Um, they have class inclinations. Yeah, they're level zero characters, essentially. So they're, they're maybe inclined to be a warrior or inclined to be a rogue or a mage or something like that, but they're not, they're not any level characters. That's one, one, one way of playing through this game if you want to really lean into that untested, untried hero kind of thing. Whereas 
the, the standard idea of Beyond the Wall is you are just about to start. I mean, like, you are starting, I should say. You're not just about to, but you are starting. This is an idea that you're, that you're like, maybe even just not ready yet, <laughs> right? Which maybe feels more in tune with the, uh, the, the material that it comes from, the, the, the inspiration material. But like this picture, right? <laughs> uh, just two peasants tying up a barbarian. Like that's that's more what you're going to be doing in this first untested adventure. Uh, and maybe there's a person in the group who is an elder. Right? And I think that's kind of cool. Like Gandalf in the Lord, in the Hobbit, I should say, how he's so much more powerful than the dwarves and Frodo or Bilbo. You have an elder there. Have somebody there who is much higher level. Um, then you have rules for mighty heroes, right? It's not just starting at a higher level, but making your characters stronger if you want to do that. So giving them more hit points, more fortune points, better armor class, more skills and traits, and better ability scores, whatever it might be. Ways of boosting up your players if you want to start them. It's still at level one, but you want to give them this or that benefit. And one thing I really like here is this sidebar where it says, how do I choose between all of this? Good advice for, you know, here's so many optional rules. What, Which ones do I do? How do I know what's right? And then there's rules about keeping track of all the changes you're making to the base game, which is cool. Additional additional rules are always good to have, even if you don't use them, um, or even if you don't use most of them, because usually there's something in there that stands out to you as useful and, and that you want to try. There are ideas of half classes, sort of like mixing together, um, and rules for how to do that. Weaker heroes, uh, to, to it's the same idea as it's mightier heroes. You don't just start at level zero. You don't just start at level uh, one or something, but you actually make your characters weaker. So instead of stronger, they're weaker as you level them up. I mean, not that they get weaker as they go up, but just you weaken them to start. And as they go forward, they're not they're not leveling up as much, and they're not the, the levels don't make as much of an impact. Rules for legendary heroes, which is characters past tenth level. How to how to get to tenth level and then to expand beyond, and rules for making your characters stronger and how to how to give, make them sort of legendary at that point. What are they going to be doing when they get past level 10? The base game assumes that's as far as you're going. And some examples, an extended example of, of what this looks like. Some new traits, uh, general traits, combat traits, spellcasting traits, and, and how to mix that in with playbooks. And then some game master advice. Know your players, feels like home, how to deal with the, how to make the village really feel like a place that they know and, and can get to know there and, and make it a, a place that changes and it's dynamic and, and have things happen there. And it's, it's good advice, again, not just general advice on how to run games, but how to run this game. I'm, I really like that kind of advice because it knows it's different and it's trying to give you advice on this particular system, not just how to run games as a GM or something like that. Um, combat and how to make it more interesting, uh, how to add the fog of war, clever maneuvers, making equipment matter, how to deal with odd hit points in this, this, this the oddity of hit points in any RPG. <laughs> it's a really weird thing to do. Rules for morale and flight and how things should stay or run, and why magic is the way that it is in this game and how things can go wrong. Cantrip mishaps, for example. Casting high-level rituals. It's magic, not science. Um, great ideas, great ideas. Optional systems, which ones to add in and how to use them and all that stuff. And then gifts of the hearth or the hearth. Right? Hearth points, hearth points, which is a new resource which you can spend to do different things in the game. Uh, this is a little bit, again, like in the One Ring, we see this with the patron points and the, uh, the hope and things like that. There are ways of spending this resource to have additional things happen in the game. That's kind of cool. Tale of year, tales of Years, The Changing of the Seasons, Running a Whole Year in the Game and How to Keep Track of It, How to Deal with Experience there, Downtime, and all of that stuff. If you're trying to have people just live on their own for a while, what's their livelihood like and how successful are they at it? And then different styles of play, like troop style of play where people come in and out, character absences and how to deal with that. Market events, different events for different settings. So military noble and political events, social farming and pastoral events, trade crafting and market events, arcane, supernatural, and fey events. Then legendary items. The cloak of stars, the fairy bow, father's sword, grandmother's gift, Wayland's hammer, the witch's blade. Great. The horned king's blade. Really cool legendary items that level up, basically. And then the broken kingdom, which is the setting here. Uh, so I'm not going to go too much into it. One of the things I want to comment on is the maps, or the maps of this. I love the maps. They are... They are um, really, really flavorful. They are right in tone with the kind of world that it's, it's building. It looks like an in-world artifact, like you could see somebody drawing this in the world and showing it to the players directly. 
Um, and that's true not just for the overworld maps, but for the like the location maps and things like that, like Kervelem, the City of Wisdom, which is this fallen city that's now kind of overrun with things. Really cool there. And there's some really, really great ideas. Uh, Karzandrius is this you know, the most powerful wizard in the world. Certainly uh, inspiration there from the Wizard of Earthsea. Spider home, the Riverlands. Now, I would say that this is, how to put this, this is generic in one sense in that it is very much like those sorts of fairy tale settings and worlds. Uh, you know, Wizard of Earthsea, the Chronicles of Pride, and it's right in that it would fit right next to them. So it's generic in the sense that it's not hyper gonzo or bizarre. It's definitely in that in the tone, but it, it fits this tone of Beyond the Wall perfectly, this world that it's developed. I think it's, they did a, a great job of building a coherent, flavorful world that fits with the way that the magic and the, and this, this sort of tone of the character playbooks and the village idea, it, it fits really well with it. So it's a world that fits right into, uh, into that idea. There's the fairy courts and the horned king, once the cruel king of winter. He's the fairy lord who rules all. Can fairies die? A good question. Terrors of below, the realm of the dead, the seat of the wise, forgotten gods, holy magic, and the languages of this world. Always, always need your own language. You always need it. You know, one of the quickest ways <laughs> to ruin the immersion of your game is to not pay attention to languages. Or I should say, maybe the other way around. One of the easiest and, and cheapest ways to, to make your setting more flavorful is to make your languages specific and unique. Such a good idea, and this, and this is a really cool way of doing it. Players tend to, I don't know why, maybe it's just my players, but they tend to really like choosing languages and liking to have their language choices matter. I don't know why that is, but they really do. Uh, particular spells for this setting, which is awesome, uh, including some of these really powerful ones. Some great magic items that are for this setting alone. Again, you could take any of these and put them in any game, but it's for this setting. A bestiary for this land, again, always a good idea to have region-specific monsters, uh, campaign-specific monsters, rather than just use the generic ones out of the book. Awesome creatures here. Uh, really creepy. The Ghost Empress, the Horned King, Greater Whites, Ingramir the Scarlet, the Empress of Fire, the Mother of Worms, the Eater of Kings. Ingramir the Scarlet is perhaps the greatest dragon still alive in the world. That's <laughs> so cool. Carsandrius, Wizard of the Southern Coasts, and the Rangers, the Weeping Princess of Autumn. And that's a name that would work right in Dolmenwood. All of those names there. You have a, a base village. I like this piece of art here, but a base village, the village of Wenfold, and the surrounding lands. A great little piece of art for this starting village, if you want to have this be your, your starting home. With the location notes and things around it. And then you have campaigns in the Kingless Realm, which is the whole setting here, Return of the Horned King, and different events that can happen around them, the people of this land, uh, and what might happen to Fae when the Horned King returns. And then you have uh, appendices. The homelands, the riverlands, the Queen's Road, the South March, Southern Coast, and Northern Mountains, a bunch of different regions there. And then character playbooks, scenario packs, and handouts for this game. The Failed Ranger, the Horned King's Blood, the Reaver's Descendant, Omen of the Horned King scenario pack, and then maps at the end. You have a uh, hex, overlay on the regular map and then it's just a normal map and you have another one which is i'm not sure what the difference here i mean i do see the difference that there are some things that have been changed in their size more has been added to this one than in the other one but uh, otherwise it's pretty much just the same map <laughs> but it's slightly different with a different border this is something you can give your players maybe and that's what this would probably be a player map a map of winfield and then zooming in on another one of these towns which is, I think, really cool. Uh, the village the village house there. Then you have a village record sheet, combat reference sheet, Return of the Horned King playback, and then extra materials at the end. Okay, so a kingless realm, dangers near and far, and further afield. All three supplements are great. If you're using Beyond the Wall, I would say they are almost just an, an automatic buy. If you're going to use this campaign, this setting, this system, get these three books. If you're not getting these three, if you're not playing Beyond the Wall or you don't intend to ever try it out or, or whatever and you're not a mad collector like I am, then I would say maybe get some of these if you have extra money, if they go on sale, if they're the sort of thing that you, if you really like the world building and the setting and the tone, 
then they're great to read and they're great inspiration. There are some good tables here, but it's not a lot of tables. I mean, there, there are some, but it's not like, you know, Maze Rats or Knave or, or Shadow Dark or something where the tables are just must buy, even if you never intend to run the system. This is not like that. The tables aren't that extensive, but there are enough of them that they're useful. But I just love having these books because I do want to run this system at some point. And I think also uh, the, um, the, the tone of it, the flavor of it is so delightful. The art is great. I really recommend these books if you're if you're like me and you really like the the, the worlds of Prydain and and uh, Earthsea, then these these are good to have, and it just it you know it's right up that that alley. All right, guys, I hope this has been interesting, and I'll see you in another video.